Hello, this is Dr. V with the Berlin Show. And this week I'm talking to Anya Ferk and I hope you will be really excited about the topic because I hope Anya will teach us how rapid transformational therapy can inspire positive change, especially in these times where most of the people that I talk to are so exhausted and tired. And um, I'm on a mission to help people um, survive burnout because I almost um, succumbed from it twice. And to tell you the truth, I had to take a week off this week because I was so exhausted. Um, <clears throat> so uh, let me just quickly introduce Anna Ferk. She has a master in psychology and she's dedicated to exploring the human mind and using her insights to foster personal and professional growth. Um, she leads with her heart in her rapid transformational therapy and I would like you to explain that further just now. Um, and also you've uh, published a book, Weave Your Life. Uh, where can we get that book, Anya? It's available on Amazon, so quite globally accessible to, to, to many people. Yeah, awesome. So I'm looking forward to see you and learn from you how to support and uplift uh, us because we need a boost in our lives and in our workplaces, especially because I get a feeling from everybody I talk to, they have to work harder to make enough money to pay the bills because life is getting so expensive. And um, I just spoke this morning to somebody who was working here, uh, had is young with three children, has chest pain and somebody else, a lady who just, died from a heart attack at the age of 52. So um, I find this is, that's why I'm saying saving lives from burnout, because if you don't listen to or make a change in your life when you're that exhausted, this is this could be the end result uh, that your body just says, I've had enough, I'm checking out. So uh, this is a very serious topic in a way, but I hope that you can uh, bring some uh, uplifting <laughs> uh, to us today. So. Uh, first question is, how did you get into the work that you do? Uh, really lovely to be to be here with you and thank you for giving me also this uh, this platform. Um, I think for me, it all goes back to that curiosity about human mind, what makes us stick in a specific way. Uh, so that also uh, is something what led me to study psychology first. Then I really focused on, OK, how are we actually working? Because I think so often in life, right, we focus on our private life, but then a big chunk of that work is actually uh, the work that we do because we work at least, let's say, 40 hours for majority of us. So I think that's approximately one third of our wake up life and it's really important that we actually do things that are uh, close to us and that are aligned with us as humans as well and i think sometimes we so focus on survival aspects of work that we forget on what else actually work brings to us um, and that i think we need to take more into account because work is actually a social privilege if we say so mm -hmm. uh, work is basically bringing us better time structure it gives us the structure of uh, activities you know like regular activities that we are doing it's also something what is actually part of our social uh, contact mm -hmm. and social identity it also gives us sense of purpose mm -hmm. and i think if we forget to take all of this into account, then it's very easy actually to burn out because we are not taking um, the job or the, the work that we do holistically, but we are more looking at one specific aspect. And this is where I think that burnout can become a very significant topic for our mental health as well as globally. I think um, if I'm not wrong, uh, World uh, Health Organization actually recognized burned out officially also last year for the yeah. first time. And I think that's also sending a big message uh, to, yes. to all of us how to consider that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's a very important point that you brought up because I often... I often say that to people when they're kind of thinking about retirement, uh, I often say like, well, I think it's actually better if you can at least keep on working part time because otherwise you'll miss the routine, the reason to get up in the morning, the feeling like you're making a difference in the world and socializing because otherwise it's too easy to just stay in bed and do nothing and become miserable. Um, so yeah, I fully agree with that. 
Um, <clears throat> however, there has to be a balance because you're talking about working 40 hours a week, but I mean, mm -hmm. some of us who are entrepreneurs, it might be more like 100 hours a week. So mm -hmm. <laughs> then you really have to um, watch out. And if you then still are a parent and you spend another 40 hours uh, being parent and a housekeeper, um, that leaves very little time for recuperation and recharging, which is uh, very important and also de-stressing. Um, in any case, yeah, that was a good start. Um, so can you explain to us what actually is rapid transformational therapy? Uh, rapid transformational therapy is basically a transformational um, approach uh, that uh, is led by Marisa Peer. Mm -hmm. uh, she's a UK-based um, um, therapist who combined basically different aspects of typical therapy, as people know it, with mm -hmm. hypnotherapy, with NLP as well, uh, and the cognitive behavioral therapy. So it brings all of those parts together in order to recognize important parts or ex important experiences from our past life where we uh, basically form some beliefs about what is true for us. Um, for example, it could be public speaking. Let's say that you were five years old and a teacher told you, you will never be a good speaker. And this as kids, of course, we take as truth for ourselves and we carry it with us throughout our work life, throughout our private life. And that's something what's holding us back. So the purpose of RTT is actually to identify those moments and to transform them, to recognize that the circumstances of that event, of course, are not relevant for us anymore and replace those beliefs with better beliefs or more supporting beliefs um, for our present and future life. Yes, lovely. I, I do. I have seen Marisa Pierce in action a few times. It's it's always, I find it lovely work, uh, which is one of the reasons that I be, I become a journey practitioner before I met her. And they do a similar thing where they combine all of these different techniques into one package to get to um, undo your limiting beliefs from childhood. Um, yeah, it's wonderful work. And it makes such a big change in the person when I've done it with one of my clients and I phone them a week later and I ask, how's it going with that problem you had? They often say like, what problem? Did I have a problem? <laughs> so it's completely <laughs> gone. Uh, and then yeah. I'm like, right, okay. That was a very good effect because they already forgot that they ever had a problem. <laughs> um, mm. So yeah, I, I do love that work also. It can be very quick change, of course, but I think it's also important, right? What we said in the beginning about work, how different aspects actually link together. I think also with RTT, that's amazing to see how one small change in one part of your life actually influence then um, how you basically behave otherwise. Because I, I don't know what your experience is um, with, uh, with your burnout that you mentioned as well that you went through, but yeah. I think often you just need that one catalysator, one ch small change that you start doing that then, you know, as a snowball progresses and your whole life or your whole approach, how you think about work or how you think about private life can completely change and turns around. No, for me, uh, I'm a very stubborn person. So I just keep on going until I crash, crack and can't get out of bed anymore mm -hmm. or end up in intensive care or something like that. So. Um, and it took me at least six months to recuperate actually from my, from the downfall. Um, so, but, but one thing I realized is that, um, that I'm not my profession or I'm not my work. So I had to come because I was very much identifying with my, uh, function, well, my, my position as a doctor. Um, and, um, but then I think the wisdom was realizing that. If I'm not there, they will just find somebody else. So I don't have to worry about mm -hmm. patients. But if I if I leave this life, I will be missed by my family, especially my children. So the priority then turns into making sure I'm okay rather than making sure everybody else is okay. And that is empty cup. Empty cup very, cannot fill others, right? Yeah, exactly. That's a very big realization, especially for women, because they often always care for everybody else and forget to care for themselves. Or they feel guilty even uh, booking a massage <laughs> while their kids need new shoes. So, um, I mean, 
it's something your children will prefer to have you there less of the time as long as you're happy um, than having you there all of the time but you're grumpy and unhappy so I think children are very understanding and forgiving even when they're small they see whether their parents are happy or not and I think they're okay with it if you need to take some time off to go and do something that helps you feel better um, so that's what I've learned on my journey with burnout um, so how can we use this RTT in people with burnout actually because yeah I mean everybody has childhood uh, traumas and limiting beliefs but what are the main ones that would come up I think from my experience trying to be perfect is one that we have to let go of because it's too time and energy consuming and it's not necessary so can you give me some other examples on how a uh, limiting belief would be leading people into burnout more and how they could rewrite it and change it into something better mm -hmm. Definitely the one that you mentioned, I, I need to be perfect is, is a big one. Another one could be also, I really need to work hard yes. because hard work is something what, what brings me success. Um, it could be also simply, you know, the beliefs such as I cannot do that, right? Or yeah, I'm stopping myself from, yeah. because, from, from succeeding because yeah. what happens if I actually do succeed? Um, so there, there are multiple beliefs that actually go back down to, to let's say, three core beliefs. One is I'm not good enough. Mm -hmm. Another one is something is not available to me. And the third one would be I'm very different from other people and I don't belong. So all those three beliefs are, let's say, somehow core beliefs that, that yeah. we have because we acquire them somehow through our life. And we all have them up to a specific extent. Now, how exactly they, um, let's say, manifest in our life, that's slightly different. So it could manifest as I'm not good enough, or it could manifest as I need to be always perfect so that people will accept me so that I will not be different. It could be also that um, this manifests as I always need to work so that I can prove myself, that I can prove to myself and to other people that I can do it. Mm -hmm. Or even that you deserve to live. I had that belief that if I'm not productive, okay. I don't deserve to live. So, um, yeah, that is, that's really important insights. I hope this uh, kind of sets off some thinking in the people who are listening to our re recording or to the podcast. And um, we still have some time to talk about... How could this play in the workplace though? Mm. So I think here we need to have a conversation on two different levels. One is how individual themselves in the workplace can create a better, let's say, opportunities for themselves to take care of themselves. And another part of that is actually more from human resources perspective or organization perspective, because I feel that sometimes all of this conversation is happening just what can I individually do in this situation? Or on the other hand side, there is all of the responsibility put on the organization to figure things out. But I think actually the best way forward for people to work well is to combine those two aspects together. So from my perspective, I would say there are three let's say biggest aspects that I can highlight um, to, to really create a good workplace. The first one is identity. So do I as employee actually know who I am? What is important to me? Where are my values? How can I live my purpose? Because once we know as individuals those answers, also when we are recruiting or when we are entering the workplace, we can recognize what will fit us better than something else because even if you're a doctor, not every single practice or not every single hospital or any other workplace will function in exactly the same way, because it depends also on what the values and what the culture of specific company or organization that we are joining is. So here on the other hand side, the organization, of course, also needs to figure out okay, what kind of purpose, what kind of principles, what kind of values do we as organization put in place so that those two pieces of puzzles can actually fit together well. Um, and I think that some, sometimes it's more taken from, okay, only the employees are the ones that need to fit into the organization, or on the other side, sometimes, 
only the organization needs to fit or cater to all of the needs that people have. But I think it's actually from both sides coming together. So mm -hmm. that would first be really like the first aspect. The second aspect for me would be actually the support. Um, support in terms of how can you create at work a support circle. So people that will encourage you, people that will inspire you. And on the third level, people that will be very concretely be able to help you operationally because they did the same things as you did. So they can give you very concrete um, examples or people that will simply open your mind up and say, look, the things that you are doing, there are other options available. Um, so that, that would be really the support aspect. And the third aspect of good workplace, I would say it's really the clarity. So as humans, we deal very um, badly, let's say, with things that are not clear, with things that are uncertain. So the question is, how can we bring that clarity into the workplace? May it be as I, being an employee in a company, how can I ask what kind of task do I need to complete? How can I get the feedback on that? How can I learn so that I am actually easier dealing with the uncertainty that is coming my way? And on the other side, of course, when we are talking about um, the responsibility of organizations or our workplaces uh, about clarity, is there a clarity of goals that we are working towards? Is it very clear how we actually collaborate with each other? So often in my work um, as human resources professional, I also recognize that those conversations about clarity are not happening. So people are more assuming, right? You, you will know what to do or the organization will tell me. And somehow this clarity then creates a lot of feelings of either I do a job and then this is not being recognized or I even don't know where to start. And then the company is unhappy with me. But in the first place, I did not even know what exactly to do. So, yeah, for me, all those three different aspects, so identity, support, and then also clarity, actually really tie into how can we create best workplaces for ourselves, or in case that, of course, your listeners are also maybe in leadership teams, or if they are actually team leads, that's definitely something to consider when you're working with, with people that, um, that you collaborate with. Yes, I hope a lot of managers are listening and having an aha moment because they never gave their staff clarity on why they have to see more patients in the same amount of time <laughs> or why mm -hmm. the main goal is not good healthcare but saving money. Uh, it's not very motivating that, is it? So um, support, I've seen it in one of my workplaces. They had this wonderful thing that one lunch, when we still had lunch breaks, uh, there was an area, it was actually kind of like a temple or a little chapel for all religions. And one day a week, they would have people giving shoulder massages there and head mm -hmm. massages. And uh, other people, volunteers would come and serve all the stuff like coffee and a biscuit or something. And people just, it was like a place to escape and to, for a moment, be quiet and pampered. And I thought it was such a lovely uh, idea. It was probably occupational health that kind of was behind it, plus the um, the church or something. And I thought it was a very lovely because it makes you feel appreciated. Um, Absolutely. For change when you're giving, giving the whole time and then you get, get to receive something for a change. It just makes a big difference. So absolutely yeah. it can be as easy it can be as easy as lunch breaks or it can be as uh, easy as you know having a mentorship program in in your company right or simply introducing a body concept i remember um, in the beginning of lockdown, we actually simply organized in one of the organizations that I worked with um, a 15 minutes catch up in the morning where everyone just came together. We all had coffee in our hands and we were just sharing one thing that we are excited to work on that day. Mm -hmm. So and then, of course, through that also, it's an easier communication channel. You also get to know what's happening with another person, because especially right now, when everything is moving towards remote, I think it's more difficult to make that connection. And the big part of that support aspect is, can I actually belong somewhere rather than fit somewhere? Mm. Right. So Renee Brown is talking a lot about that in her book. And I think that's something very important to consider when we talk also about work, when we talk about burnout as well. Like, do you have the space to actually express who you are as a person? 
or is it just about okay you come to work and you just do what you need to do and then you leave um, again linking back to what we discussed in the beginning that work is way more than just a place where you go um, i think i recently listened also to simon sinek who said today's workplace is becoming way more than just financial security or safety that we had maybe 20, 30, 40 years back. Because before we also had social communities, you know, we all had hobbies, we all also went maybe to church. Um, and that's something what's not happening so much these days anymore. So the work really becomes the place where we become um, ourselves as a person. We discover our social networks. Also, it's really difficult to make friends or many people say that it's difficult to make friends anywhere else than at work, because that's where you actually spend the most time with other people. So that social aspect of belonging, it's really becoming more and more uh, important. And that's why I think also more and more organizations from their perspective, they need to start looking into how to actually create the people centric place by creating their identity, by creating that opportunities to connect and also by providing that structure. Yeah, I can see a lot of work needs to be done in most of the places that I've worked over the last 10 years. It's not happening. <laughs> Uh, but I had my own practice for 10 years in Australia and I we did that. We sat down together like everybody, not every day, but uh, regularly said like, okay, what's our, what's our mission for this year? What do you want? Is there anything you want to do personally? Do you want to learn something new? Do you want to change roles? Like I gave everybody an opportunity to be creative and speak up. Like, I think I want to do this this year or I want to learn a bit more about that. And um, or I don't want to do that anymore. And I'll, we'll find somebody else to do that. So, I mean, I'm not saying that I'm perfect whatsoever, but I do feel like it's teamwork and there should be an open communication between all with the decision makers and the people on the floor because they know best what's going on. And you need to listen to those mm -hmm. people. And uh, advice for people who are like in a company where maybe they feel like they're not being appreciated for all the work they do. Uh, one tip that I have is if you write down every day all the things, all the things that you have done, then you will be very impressed. And if you actually show this to somebody who doesn't think you do much and say, like, I've done all of these 20 tasks today, what do you think? Then they might say, like, oh, I didn't realize you did so much. Um, because there's jobs that you, they never think about. So sometimes that helps to get a bit more appreciation, like for yourself and to, to actually show other people how much you do. There's nothing wrong with that because they might not always see it because they're not always there. You know, they might be sitting in an office somewhere and not realizing how much is going on here um, where the real work happens. So, yeah, this is interesting. Um, I'm glad you exist and you give with your HR you can improve on some work places <laughs> um but um yeah we could definitely I think yeah I think you I think you shared two really good practices actually um I think meeting together sitting down together and talking about okay what are the next steps you know uh, maybe this on yearly basis or maybe even on a weekly basis it really depends also on the on the team right and the nature yeah. of work i think that's that's a great idea to put in practice also what you said with um i'm calling that actually like achievement journal um and it is about you recognizing also what you did because so often we have you know the to-do list mm. but that's actually achievement list which is just slightly different because with to-do list we are really focusing on everything what we did not yet achieve but we need to do it and here we actually take time to just sit down and appreciate so mm. i think always when it comes to workplace i think it's good to get to know yourself better and also recognize not only the things that you need to improve on but also things that you're already good at so to yeah. really know your skill set as well um, and then on the other side also to create the opportunities for yourself to put that skill set to practice mm -hmm. because so often we feel that we leave a lot of our skill sets just somewhere and we don't really utilize on it mm. but there are always some ways how we can actually get that fulfillment as well right and that feeling of purpose maybe through achieving tasks or maybe simply by the way how we are collaborating with other people and that can also helps us then to introduce more of that self-care actions 
mm. maybe even earlier than before you actually burn out and then you need a long time to actually recuperate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. Uh, if if there's an availability or a freedom or time to to really show your t talents off, I think in some places people uh, get the opportunity when they say, I'm really good with computers, let me take that. Um, so yeah, that, that, that's great. That is ideal when that happens. Um, so I don't want to go on too long without you uh, telling me us a bit about your book, Weave Your Life and how people can contact you or follow you on social media. I'll put the links in the description also. So what is your book about? So Weave Your Life is basically 31 days journey for each individual to maybe ask questions that they never asked before, because all of the change starts with you questioning things that you think that they were true. Um, and this starts, for example, already just with giving advice. Everything what you heard today you need to actually look at that and say, what can I apply into my life and what maybe is not fitting for me? Because not every advice will fit for absolutely um, everyone. And there are some a few other topics that can help you actually in creating your best life by, by really asking those questions yourself. Um, so basically the series uh, of books, the second book is coming out soon as well, um, is called Fleeting Thought, because the idea is there are so many thoughts that are all the time running through our heads and if we can just stop, take a second to just ask, is this thought actually true? Is this thought actually still serving me? Or yeah. do I want maybe to introduce another thought? Um, and of course, with RTT, um, this is also possible then in a structured way to, to, to basically reframe. But I think already the book is a, is a nice start to ask yourself, what do I actually believe in? What do I actually, how do I want to think? What thoughts do I want to think more of? Um, and the idea of each chapter is that basically as you read through the thinking, you then also decide, okay, what is actually my version of answer to this topic? Awesome. Wow, that sounds very interesting. So we'll definitely put the links there. And are you very active on social media? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I forgot already that, that you asked <laughs> me for the handles. So people can definitely find me on social media. So I'm on LinkedIn under my name, Anja Ferg. Otherwise, you can find me on Instagram under the tag Growth Nook. And I will share also the website so that that link will be accessible. Yes. If you can share the links, then I'll make sure it gets published. Okay. Uh, well, I, I really value that you managed to get so much uh, information in a short period of time, which is perfect time management. Thank you so much. <laughs> um, I have another Thank you for interview coming up. So this is going to end soon. I'll stop the recording.